Mark and Priority. The view that Mark was the first of the Synoptic Gospels written occupies a dominant place in New Testament scholarship today. In this video, we'll look at the history of the theory, the principal arguments in its favor, and the reasons why I find these arguments interesting, but not compelling. To be sure, there are many and various theories that agree on Mark and Priority and differ on other details. We're going to focus on the principal contention they have in common, that Mark was written first. Mark and Priority first appears in New Testament scholarship in the late 18th century, and by the mid-19th century was becoming a major viewpoint. Of particular note is the 1863 work by German scholar H.J. Holtzman, who argued extensively that Mark was written prior to Matthew and Luke. His ideas caught on particularly well in the German universities, and it is difficult to overstate the high level of influence that the German universities had on global New Testament scholarship in the 19th and early 20th centuries, and indeed they took Mark and Priority to the globe. Mark and Priority reached what we might call its zenith or capstone with the landmark work of B.H. Streeter in 1924. By this point, many people took Mark and Priority as a given, case closed. Mark and Priority had a virtual monopoly on synoptic studies. In understanding Mark and Priority's meteoric rise to popularity against a theory that Matthew was written first, which had stood for 17 plus centuries, there are two political realities we should note. Number one, the work of German skeptic David Friedrich Strauss. Strauss was dogmatically opposed to a belief in miracles, and he used this belief as a premise to argue that the New Testament stories of Jesus were fantasy and fraud. He sent shockwaves through theologians and scholars alike, and many sought for an effective way to rebut his claims. Mark and Priority proved to be a useful tool in the right place at the right time. You see, Strauss believed that Matthew was written first, then Luke, and then Mark. Strauss found much that was objectionable to him, because it was so miraculous, in the infancy narratives and post-resurrection appearances recorded in Matthew and Luke that aren't in Mark. Thus, some opposed to Strauss suggested, may we go ahead and grant that Matthew and Luke are late, unreliable embellishments, but we think Mark was written first. We can argue that Mark has earlier information and that if it's in Mark, it is reliable. This proved to be a double-edged sword, but it was popular among many opponents of Strauss. Second political reality. In the 1860s, just as Holtzman's ideas were making their way through German universities, Otto von Bismarck was in the process of unifying a German superpower, and he was politically at odds with the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church uses the Gospel of Matthew, particularly Matthew chapter 16, and the writings of early Christian historians to support its claims of authority through apostolic succession. These early Christian historians tell us that Matthew was written first. They're unanimous on this point. Thus, Mark and Priority provided Bismarck and his allies with an opportunity too good to refuse. If Mark was written first, and Matthew was a later unreliable embellishment, then there went the Catholic Church's claims of authority from Matthew and the reliability of their early historians. He could undercut their claims of authority with one fell swoop. Naturally, Bismarck pushed Mark and Priority on the German universities, where it did quite well. We see English-speaking King writers also taking up the charge, most notably we mentioned B.H. Streeter. By the time of Streeter's writings, Mark and Priority was so well accepted that many were already building theories upon it as a foundation. We'll take this as a given, and that will allow us to explore further questions. As a result, when a generation later, Butler decisively rebutted several of Streeter's fundamental arguments, scholars were hesitant to back away from Mark and Priority. There were too many books, articles, and dissertations that relied upon Mark and Priority, that used it as a starting point. They didn't want to give up all of that work. That's a natural human response, and it left Mark and Priority in the driver's seat. One of the effects is that even today, most New Testament professors were taught Mark and Priority from their earliest courses, as were their professors before them, as were those who wrote today's textbooks. Exposure to other theories, if it came at all, often came later, after they'd been thoroughly taught that Mark and Priority is the accepted theory, and as they had seen 
but to oppose it could be a career-limiting move. Now, I do not bring up this history to say, therefore, market priority is false. No, the evidence could still be good, even if the motives were not always altruistic. To say otherwise would be to commit a genetic fallacy. No, I bring up this history in order to respond to the claim that we should automatically believe in Markan priority because a majority of New Testament scholars do. No, we've seen that Markan priority's rise did have some ulterior motives. And we've seen that once a scholarly consensus is established, it can be difficult to break. No, I suggest that many New Testament scholars believe in Markan priority for the simple reason that this is what they were taught and most of them are not, in fact, specialists in this particular esoteric question. And they know that if they challenge the consensus on this point, not only will it distract from whatever their area of specialization is, but it will also detract from their credibility. Indeed, there have even been reported cases where professors were only allowed to teach market priority and not competing views. Thus, recognizing that scholarly consensus is a fickle friend and that even academia sits on shifting sands that can be influenced by political priorities, we're going to peel back the layers of the onion and take a look at the evidence itself. We will consider six major arguments, or categories of arguments, used today for market priority. True, there are other arguments that have been used in the past, but they've largely been set aside because they've been found to be less effective. The arguments to which we will direct our focus are the argument from the prophecy of the destruction of the temple, the shorter length of Mark, the less polished Greek of Mark, patterns in word choice, editorial fatigue, and the argument from order. The first of these arguments, from the prophecy of the destruction of the temple, we examined in the third segment in this series, and we found it to be a case of circular reasoning. We won't consider it further here. The next two we'll take together the length of Mark, and the less polished Greek of Mark. Mark is by far the shortest gospel, whereas Matthew and Luke were each written to essentially fill one commercial scroll of papyrus available at the time. Mark doesn't even come close, leading many to suggest that they can see why Matthew and Luke, if drawing material from Mark, would add content, but they cannot see why Mark, if drawing material from Matthew and Luke, would leave out so much good content. Why exclude the Sermon on the Mount? I do offer a gentle caution about claiming to know the mind of the author. But just looking at the text itself, ironically, in the triple tradition, that is material found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three, it is very often Mark who is the most verbose. He uses the most words to tell a story. Thus, the argument from length has to simultaneously maintain A, Matthew and Luke clearly copied from Mark because they added content to Mark, and B, Matthew and Luke clearly copied from Mark because they removed content from Mark. They wrote more concisely. Perhaps it's not so clear after all. Some have suggested that Matthew and Luke wrote more concisely because they wanted to leave room on their scrolls for other stories they wanted to tell. This is certainly possible. But what is the evidence for it? Any argument we would marshal in favor of this hypothesis is an argument that presupposes mark and priority. That doesn't work. We can't presuppose mark and priority in order to validate the evidence we're trying to use to demonstrate mark and priority. Now, that's not a logically valid argument. In just a moment, we'll consider a hypothesis that can also explain this evidence that does not presuppose its conclusion. But first, let's take a look at Mark's Greek. Without question, the Greek of Mark is less polished than that of Matthew and Luke in many places. Mark includes what many people call hard sayings, as well as less dignified sayings. He'll say things like, Jesus could do no miracle there, or that his family said he was beside himself. Mark will sometimes use very awkward word choices, suggesting to many that they can see why Matthew and Luke would want to improve Mark's grammar, but they cannot see why Mark would degrade the grammar of Matthew and Luke if they were his sources. Surely the later document is the one with the better grammar. This is an appealing assertion, but it doesn't stack up well against the evidence. The most closely correlated example we have shows the evidence going the other way. In the early centuries of Christianity, there were a number of splinter groups that broke off from what would later be known as Orthodox Christianity. Some of them wrote their own Gospels, most notably the Gnostics, and although it was clearly fraudulent, they would put the names of apostles or other famous people on these documents in order to give them an air of authority. This is generations after the Apostles. For example, nobody believes that the Gospel of Philip was written by the Apostle Philip. It's clearly a forgery. But these later fake Gospels give us an objective means of testing the hypothesis we're considering. 
that the later document should be the one with the better grammar, because these later fake Gospels often use the canonical Gospels as sources. So they should improve their grammar, right? This is exactly what they do not do. They degrade the grammar. Precisely the opposite of what this argument for Mark and Priority says should happen. This was summed up well by William Farmer, a notable synoptic scholar who said, Sometimes writers improve the grammar of their sources, while others spoil it. Such considerations provide no objective basis to adjudge one document primary or secondary to another. There is no provable correlation between style and chronology. This proves to be the undoing of this argument. But there is a simpler solution. Why is Mark shorter? Why is the Greek less polished? It turns out people have been asking questions about the style of Mark for many, many years, long before modern historians took up the charge. We're going to go all the way back to Papias, an early bishop of Hierapolis, writing in the early 2nd century, quoting material from the 1st century, so very early material here. Papias explained that Mark wrote based on the preaching of Peter, and that Mark was careful to preserve what Peter taught. Clement of Alexandria, writing a century later, corroborates Papias and also provides additional details not found in any known quotation of Papias, suggesting we have an independent strand of information here. Certainly, we could cite many other early documents that also point out that Mark wrote based on the preaching of Peter, recognizing that they may at least in part be dependent upon Papias and or Clement. So we've got at least two sources, possibly more, which by the way is much better attestation than we have for most events in history. And another data point that many of these sources cite is that Mark was written in Rome based on preaching in Rome. This interacts positively with the internal evidence of the text. Mark includes more Latinisms than all the other Gospels combined. Mark will sometimes use a concept familiar to a Roman audience to explain a concept that would be unfamiliar to a Roman audience. So we do have some points of contact here between the internal and external evidence. But even if we were to say, we're not really sure how closely this is related to Peter, even just the very fact that over and over and over and over again we have early historians telling us Mark is based on preaching provides us a ready solution to the question, why is Mark shorter? Why is the Greek not as good? Mark is written the way you would speak a story rather than the way you would traditionally write a story. Mark is oral in a way that is different from the formal literary treatises of Matthew and Luke. So obvious, in fact, is the oral nature of Mark that there are people who will memorize Mark and perform it, oral performance. The content fits that setting so well. B. H. Streeter described Mark as the shorthand notes of an extemporaneous sermon, and I might add perhaps the shorthand notes of an extemporaneous sermon given in a second language. What does this have to do with Mark's Greek? It is well documented that people tend to use better grammar when they write than they do when they speak. Why? Because when you write, you can take long pauses to think about what you want to say next. You can go back and edit. When you speak live, sometimes you say things that come out wrong. Sometimes you say hard sayings. I submit that Mark is trying to preserve the way the material was spoken, even if sometimes it was spoken awkwardly. We'll now look at two powerful internal arguments from the text itself that support this hypothesis. Number one, Mark includes no long sermons by Jesus. Jesus was an itinerant preacher. He would have said a lot. Matthew and John each devote a lot of space to long sermons. Luke, less so. Mark, none. Mark is the action-oriented gospel. I submit that Mark is exactly what you would expect to find if a dynamic Christian preacher spoke extemporaneously and somebody took notes. Indeed, Greek shorthand did exist at the time, so it's plausible. We even find in Mark what some people call Mark and sandwiches. He'll tell part of story one, he'll blend it into story two, and then blend it back into story one and show a common theme between the stories. This is a chiastic structure that also happens to be a brilliant means of remembering content and telling it in a particular order. Anybody who has studied public speaking knows that a dynamic speaker does not read a sermon word for word. You use bullet points, whether written or in your head. I'm going to talk about this point, then this point, then this point, and I'll expand upon them as I speak. 
This model works very well for telling stories. That's what Mark is, a storyteller. Especially well for stories of events at which the speaker was present. This model does not work well for reciting long monologues given by somebody else, and that's exactly what we don't see in Mark. Why, then, does Mark exclude the Sermon on the Mount? The same reason he excludes all of the other long sermons. This is preaching largely given from memory. Number two, we already noted that Mark tends to be the most verbose of the synoptic authors. He'll use the most words to tell a story. It is easier to write a story concisely than it is to speak a story concisely. Try it out. It's an interesting exercise. When you write, you can economize your words. You can go back and edit many times. When you speak live, it's easy to become repetitive, to make mistakes, to say things awkwardly, and to become long-winded and throw in extraneous details that you would edit out in a second or a twelfth draft. This is not to say that the speaker could not have had written notes. That's possible. This is not to say that the writer who took the shorthand notes and wrote them out longhand could not have had access to earlier written documents. That's possible, too. This is to say that the core of Mark is the way the gospel was being spoken. If Matthew and Luke are the peer-reviewed literature of the time, Mark is the powerful sermon. The genius of Mark is the storytelling, not the semantics. There are some in ivory towers who become frustrated that if Mark has this document as a source, he's not behaving the way he's supposed to, and sometimes using this word and sometimes not. I submit that early Christian preachers did not live in ivory towers, nor did their scribes. In the real world, people can tell the same story many times and not use exactly the same words each time. What we see then is that this hypothesis that Mark is preserving in large degree the way material was being spoken is consistent with the external evidence. It is amply supported by the internal evidence, and it can explain the length and poorer Greek of Mark with no appeal to a priori assumptions about the order in which the Gospels were written. Incidentally, if we are sufficiently open-minded to at least consider the possibility that the ancient historians knew what they were talking about when they said that it was Peter's testimony that stands behind the Gospel of Mark, if that is so, it should come as no surprise that the words of the Galilean fishermen would be somewhat less polished than those of the Gospels of Matthew, and especially Luke. Argument number four, patterns in word choice. We're going to break this one down into two categories. First is arguments from the perceived intent of the gospel writer, and second, arguments from borrowed words. The first of these two isn't going to get us very far, because in the past century plus, the overwhelming majority of studies that have endeavored to ascertain the intent the gospel writer had have presupposed Mark in priority. That is, in saying that Mark's intent was X and Matthew's intent was Y, they already assumed Mark in priority in order to get to that point. An argument that takes Mark in priority as a premise cannot be used to prove Mark in priority as a conclusion. Indeed, we find that both Mark and Matthean prioritists have had no trouble in positing plausible intents of the author that align with their own personal views. Thus, the plethora of papers suggesting, based on the intent of the author we think Mark wrote first, is a reflection rather than a cause of the popularity of Mark and priority. We'll spend a little bit more time on the argument from borrowed words. This is where scholars have found that writers have a literary fingerprint, calling cards, favorite words and phrases that are helpful in identifying their work. When this is studied scientifically, it's known as stylometry, and where sufficient data is available, it has been used to identify the author of anonymous documents. In the context of the Gospels, various scholars have put together lists of what appear to be favorite words and phrases of each Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They can then look for these words and phrases in the other Gospels in the right context in order to make a case for plausible borrowing. One of the most popular examples of this phenomenon is Mark's use of the word immediately. Mark likes this word. He uses it a lot. Matthew less so. In fact, in every case, save one exception, where Matthew uses a form of the word immediately, there's a parallel in Mark. This is interesting, that in the portions of Matthew that overlap with Mark, the word immediately shows up a fair amount, but in the portions of Matthew that do not overlap with Mark, Matthew seldom uses the word. On Mark and priority, this is explicable by saying that Matthew didn't often choose this word on his own, but if he saw it in his source, sometimes he would go ahead and copy it. I submit that this argument is not compelling. 
As we noted earlier, Mark is the action-oriented gospel. You would expect a word like immediately to show up more frequently in describing what people were doing than in the context of long sermons. And it is the portions of Matthew and Mark that overlap that lean heavily towards what people were doing, whereas the portions of Matthew that are not in Mark lean much more heavily towards the long sermons. This evidence, then, is not surprising, that Matthew would use the word immediately more in the doing portion of his gospel than in the saying portions. So I don't find this to be a particularly persuasive case for Mark and priority. It could be explained with either Matthew copying Mark or Mark copying Matthew. Furthermore, if Matthew is using the word immediately because he's copying it from Mark, we have a consistency problem on the part of Matthew. You see, Mark is consistent in his spelling of immediately in Greek. Matthew's not. He uses two different spellings. If Matthew's just using this word because he sees it in Mark and he's copying it, then why does he sometimes use Mark's spelling and sometimes mix it up? This inconsistency would be at odds with the claim by many who propose Mark and priority that it is Matthew's consistent and cohesive writing style that suggests that he was written later and he's copying from Mark. This is a case where we find arguments for Mark and priority playing both sides of the net. On the one hand, we're told that it is the author who uses the word more consistently who wrote first, and the author who uses the word less consistently that wrote second. On the other hand, we're told to expect that the author who wrote second is refining and standardizing the less consistent and more unusual writing of the first. Which is it? Is Mark the more consistent or less consistent writer? Either way, it is the arguments for Mark and priority that are inconsistent. Another shortcoming of the argument from borrowed words, in general, is that it's reversible. We can find evidence going the other way. Some of the favorite Matthean phrases include things like, when even was come, or son of David, and we see Mark using them in the right context to suggest on this argument that Mark copied them from Matthew. With evidence pointing in multiple directions, a number of scholars have sought to mathematically evaluate where is the evidence stronger. They've produced a variety of results. David Barrett Peabody has noted that the vast majority of these studies have either implicitly or explicitly presupposed Mark and priority. In comparing the Gospels, in coming up with the lists of words, They've already assumed that Mark wrote first. If Mark and priority is one of our assumptions, then it should come as no surprise that the study produces results that are consistent with the assumptions by which it was constrained. A notable exception to this presupposition error is the work of Edward Zeller. In 1843, Zeller published his own efforts to mathematically evaluate who is more likely to be borrowing from whom, and he didn't presuppose which gospel was written first. Zeller indeed found that the evidence points in multiple directions, but the weight of the evidence did not. He found it was much more likely, there was far more evidence, that Mark was borrowing from Matthew than the other way around. There was also far more evidence that Mark was borrowing from Luke than the other way around. Between Matthew and Luke themselves, the evidence was less one-sided. In effect, in Zeller's data, for every example we can cite where it looks like Matthew borrowed this word from Mark, there are two examples going the other way. There's twice the evidence that it was Mark who borrowed from Matthew. Zeller's data come out strongly against the view that Mark was written first. The data suggests that Mark was written third. And what are we to make of the data pointing in multiple directions? I think we have to allow that it's at least possible that two authors could independently use the same word. But where this happens over and over again, it's more challenging to appeal to coincidence. Prominent New Testament scholar Theodore von Zahn in the early 20th century proposed a clever hypothesis. He suggested that Matthew was written first in a Semitic language. Mark, written later in Greek, used Matthew as a source, and when Matthew was even later translated into Greek, the translator referenced the Greek of Mark. Thus, Matthew influenced Mark, and Mark influenced Matthew. This is an interesting theory. In a later segment in this series, we'll explore it in greater depth and expand upon it. To summarize, then, the argument from patterns in word choice, what we find is far too often they fall prey to presupposing the conclusion they're trying to prove. And even when they don't, the arguments are reversible. Because the evidence points in multiple directions, people can find evidence in patterns in word choice to support whatever assumptions they started with. Argument number five, editorial fatigue. This argument has been growing in popularity in recent years, particularly as older arguments have become less tenable. I suggest that this is probably the best argument for Mark and Priority. 
As a quick recap from the second segment in this series on what editorial fatigue is, this is when author 2 is copying from author 1 and makes some changes. Perhaps they think they can tell the story a little bit better, a little more clearly, but sometimes they fail to sustain the changes throughout and fall back on using the original author's language, thus tipping us off as to who their source was. One of the most popular examples of editorial fatigue in the Gospels is in Matthew's account of the execution of John the Baptist by Herod Antipas. Mark consistently refers to Antipas as a king. Although Antipas may have styled himself as such, he was actually lower on the totem pole. Antipas' title was Tetrarch. When Matthew tells the story, he starts by correctly referring to Herod as a Tetrarch, but later on refers to Herod Antipas as a king. On Mark and Priority, this is explicable by saying that Matthew was copying from Mark. The first time he saw Mark say king, he said, oh no, he wasn't a king, he was a tetrarch, and he corrected it. But he forgot to make the change later. Another case of editorial fatigue is when author one introduces some context at the beginning of the story and then refers to it later. Author two, in copying from author one, does not introduce the context earlier, but still refers to it later, having apparently forgotten that they didn't tell that part of the story in their own account. A prominent example of this in the Gospels is in the pericope, or story, of Jesus' mother and brethren. Here Mark explicitly tells us that they're in a house. Matthew mentions crowds, but not the house. Later, both Mark and Matthew tell us that his mother and brethren are outside, and the reader of Matthew is left to wonder, outside of what? Matthew didn't tell us that they were in a house, Mark did. I submit that these arguments are much more evidence-based than those we've considered previously. But using editorial fatigue to argue for Mark and priority suffers from three substantial shortfalls. Shortfall number one. This argument, too, is reversible. We can find evidence going the other way, where it looks like Mark is copying from Matthew. James Deardorff has written on this, and I'll cite a few of his examples. How much bread did the disciples bring? Compare Mark 8 with Matthew 16. What is the reward being referred to? Compare Mark 9 with Matthew 10. Where did Bartimaeus go after being healed? Compare Mark 10 with Matthew 20. And what did the Romans do with Jesus' clothes? Compare Mark 15 to Matthew 27. In each case, there is context provided by Matthew that is either different or excluded in Mark, but both Matthew and Mark later refer to the Matthean context, suggesting that it is Mark who is editorially fatigued in copying from Matthew. Given evidence pointing in multiple directions, editorial fatigue is unclear as an indicator of source. Now perhaps Mark and Matthew got together in some as yet unknown synoptic conspiracy and deliberately mixed up the evidence for the sole purpose of confusing scholars today. Or maybe we have to allow that different authors thought about different details at different times in recounting a story. Shortfall number two. What if Mark is providing context to clarify an unclear story in Matthew? Mark is the master storyteller. It is notable that proponents of Mark and priority frequently point to the clarity of Matthew and say clearly Matthew wrote second because he's expanding upon and embellishing Mark's writings. So we're told that when Mark has greater clarity, clearly Mark wrote first. And when Mark has lesser clarity, clearly Mark wrote first. I'm not sure this argument is so clear after all. This logical inconsistency betrays a presupposition of Mark and priority into which the evidence is then forced to fit. Shortfall number three, this argument isn't the only way to explain the data. In segment six in this series, we'll look at another hypothesis that can also explain this evidence of editorial fatigue, but without the shortcomings we've cited here. In summary, then, Editorial fatigue can be used to suggest that Matthew or Mark wrote first, but does not make an incontrovertible case for either. Editorial fatigue is probably the strongest argument for Mark and priority, but it remains inconclusive. Argument number six, the argument from order. This used to be one of the most popular arguments for Mark and priority. Some would have even suggested it was the best of the arguments. That is, until B.C. Butler and others pointed out that using the argument from order for Mark and priority relies upon a simple but crucial logical flaw. Butler referred to it as a schoolboyish error in logical reasoning. 
So devastating were the attacks by Butler and those who followed him that the major proponents of Markan priority today tend to shy away from this argument, whereas those arguing for Matthean priority regularly employ it. In the next segment in this series, we will examine Matthean priority, and we will see why this argument makes a much better case for Matthean priority than it does for the priority of Mark. In conclusion, as we've considered the major categories of arguments for Markan priority, we've found that these are arguments that work particularly well if people already believe in Markan priority. Indeed, that is the world from which they came. Virtually everybody did. But that widespread existing belief came from the work of earlier scholars. People like Weiss, Holtzman, Streeter, and others. Today's arguments build upon the foundation they laid, but these earlier arguments have been set aside. They've been found to be lacking and scholarship has moved on. What I see then in Markan priority is a theory that is struggling to keep its head above water. New arguments must be invented as old arguments are cut down, but we have to preserve the conclusion of Markan priority because we like the conclusion, because we've built so much upon it. This is the danger of a theory that goes without serious competition for too long. It has been taken for granted. Today's arguments rest upon this foundation, but these earlier arguments have been overturned, they've been rebutted, their flaws have been exposed, what remains is the belief that they created. Today's arguments rest upon a foundation of belief, but a belief that is vapid. The evidence has largely eroded. Ask these arguments to go the distance on their own, without the advantage of arguing for a conclusion that most people already agree with, and they do not make the cut. We've examined the arguments. We found that each was circular, or reversible, or both. This does not make a compelling case for Markan priority. I used to believe in Markan priority. It's what I was taught. But a deep dive on the evidence led me to change my mind. I am persuaded that the dominant position occupied by Markan priority in New Testament scholarship today has far more to do with the politics of scholarship. It was a theory in the right place at the right time. than it has to do with the evidence itself. On the basis of the evidence, I am left to conclude that Mark was not the first gospel written.